Thank you, thank you. Well, kia ora koutou. Um, tua tahi mihi tēnei, ki o mātua kore, nāna nei te teto tātou ao e whakairo, a rā ko rangi nui e tui honei, ko papatua nuku e takoto nei noa, ki a rāua tamariki nui tonu, kei te mihi, kei te mihi. Uh, tua rua, ka tangi ki ngā mate huhua o te wā, haere atu rā koutou haere, haere, kei te mana whenua ki ngā Māori o te rohe nei, kei te mihi, kei te mihi. Papa ki tuana ngā tai o mihi ki runga i a koutou katoa, ka hui hui mai nei, uh, no tangaroa me hine moana te take, uh, kei taku eti, kei taku rahi, he mihi tēnei ki a koutou katoa kua tai mai nei. Uh, I raro I, I te tuanui o tēnei kaupapa, kei te mihi, kei te mihi. Um, kia ora koutou katoa, uh, e noho ana au i te tihi o titirangi, te ro whakaaro um, ki ngā wai o Turanganui a Kiwa, ka mau taku aro ki te whānui tanga o Ngāti Onunui mai i pauawa ki te tuka a tai au. Um, te whenua taurikura o Ngāti Onunui, ngā uri o ngā waka e toru ko te karua rauru, ko rauta, ko taki tumu hoki. Uh, ka kai aku matua ki te ahakāroa o uh, Ngāti Onunui ki te poho rauri, uh, ko te poho rauri te wha wharenue, ko rauri te ketua, te rangi, te tangata, te hei Māori ora. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, my name is Beth Tupara Katane. I have from a small town on the east coast, on the North Island, a place called Tūranganui Akiwa, uh, but some of you might know it as Gisborne, the first place to see the sun. Um, I'm here today to talk about our research project, um, Tangaro Ararau, uh, Tikanga Māori, Te Tariti o Waitangi and Marine Governance. Um, Sorry, I thought I'd had a plinth, like, so you wouldn't see all my papers, so <laughs> apologise for that. Um, all right, so um, one of the key outcomes for sustainable seas is to give effect to Te Tariti o Waitangi, where the rights and perspectives of Māori are central to the marine governance and management regime for Aotearoa. Um, from our team's perspective, and I might just mention, I have Te Aumuhia Walker, um, who's one of our research team members here today, and I'm also going to sort of take in the Te Ohu team members that are here as well as, as um, Kai Tautoko, so just mahi to them. Um, from our team's perspective, our unique opportunity to innovate in the marine environment lies in our whakapapa. And it's interesting just listening to Pia um, previously and her kōrero, um, a lot of what I'm going to say is sort of aligns with that. So I'm sure you're going to probably hear similar um, things from, from each of us. Our tikanga-based approach and management practices have, have evolved specifically for Aotearoa's oceanscape. Just as our Polynesian ancestors became Māori in the context of this land and this sea, so too our practices became uniquely developed for our shores. All parts are connected and all parts have a role in the health and well-being of one another, leading to the prosperity of our moana and people. Mana atua, mana moana, mana tangata. I'm just going to give you a nice sort of soothing water picture, oceans picture. We're just going to provide you a bit of um, some context of where this sort of kaupapa has come from. Um, traditionally, marine management concepts and approaches were defined by tikanga Māori. Developed over generations through sustained interaction with Aotearoa's marine environment. The system was confirmed through Article 2 of Te Tariti o Waitangi, where the collective rights and responsibilities of Māori to live as Māori and to protect and develop our tonga were guaranteed. Tikanga Māori and the intent of Te Tariti remains functionally absent from the present system governing the marine environment. The hierarchy of importance within the system remains heavily weighted towards extractive property rights and the effective subjugation of oceans to human resources requirements. What is fascinating is that the world is now clamouring to adopt a more holistic approach to governing and managing the marine environment. Many countries don't need to venture too far. This wisdom exists within our indigenous communities who despite having their beliefs, values and ways of being criticised of being criticised and marginalised for generations, have continued their practices in a way that is appropriately, um, culturally appropriate to them. 
While eco-based management is being used as a concept that aligns with indigenous views, it is essential to recognise the risk inherent in oversimplifying complex and nuanced indigenous concepts such as kaitiakitanga when attempting to translate them into Western frameworks. Indigenous knowledge systems deeply rooted in cultural heritage and interconnectedness with the environment encompass layers of understanding that may be lost or misrepresented when they're reduced to fit within Western paradigms. By acknowledging and respecting the complexity of these con concepts, we can foster more authentic and equitable collaborations that, in, that honour Indigenous perspectives while striving for sustainable outcomes for all. The purpose of our research, getting to our research, um, so that context um, sort of sets, I suppose, one of the things when I first came, or well, was approached to lead this particular research project. Um, it was at that time called Eco-Based Management and Te Tiriti o Waitangi. Um, and as Linda knows, <laughs> I was of the view, I was, it, it didn't sit well, I suppose, with me. Um, especially if we're trying to look at how do we take a more tikanga approach to stuff and and I think that that's why I sort of raised in that last slide was around just being very careful in the way in which we try to blend mātauranga Māori, tikanga Māori with Western frameworks. Um, there are ways in which we can do it, but there are, to do those well, you need to, yeah, we need to work better together to do those things. So, um, as I said, our, our project's called Tang Tangaro Ararau, so I, re I renamed the project um, and <laughs> And it was, again, to be sort of more authentic to what I saw that this project needed to go down the path of. Um, so our project, the purpose of it is to identify the barriers um, facing decision makers and giving genuine effect to te tiriti and tikanga Māori and marine governance and management. Um, it's exploring options for dismantling those barriers and identifying transitional pathways to assist us to the achieve the overarching goal, which is to develop marine governance options that are underpinned by Te Tiriti and Te Kanga Māori. Uh, I did see Eric's um, slide with, with faces of the team, and I had thought about doing that, but the, the amount of time it would have taken me to get my team to give permission to put their photos up here <laughs> would have taken a lot longer. Um, so, to mato tima. Um, so, to achieve our goals, we've assembled, assembled a tight knit team um, with diverse uh, expertise and extensive experience. Our backgrounds span policy, legislation, marine science, resource management, co governance, iwi engagement, and representation, with each member holding roles within their respective iwi and hapu. So, I'm going to say their names, even though their photos aren't up there. Um, so, we have as I mentioned, Te Ao uh, we have the support of um, members from Fire Legal. So over the journey of our project, um, Huriana Irwin East Hope has been um, supporting us as well as Annalise Samuels, Kate Tarafiti and Tony Love. So we have had quite a few people involved in here. Um, with Awatea, uh, it's myself and um, Te Pōho Katane, and then as well as Te Hu Kaimuana. So we have had different members sort of popping in and out. Initially, Te Ao was with Te Hu Kaimuana. Uh, we've had Te Ho. We've also had reviewers from um, Te Hu Kaimuana look at our bits and pieces along the way. Um, Graham Hastelo, Tama Wells. So yeah, we've had a, quite a mix of people. And there's also people in the room that we've had Wānanga with as well. So, um, and then our last, our last one down here is um, a man called Chris Jackson, who is from We Create Futures. And um, we brought him into the team because the focus of our project is around the future. So looking at the future. And so he was brought in to support us in design and futures thinking. Um, where am I going? So our project has four parts. Um, where are we at? So first one being setting our tikanga um, driven guardrails for the research team. Um, exploring three focus areas um, and their drivers of change. So we focused on Māori customary fishing, Māori commercial fishing and the Marine and Coastal Areas Act. Um, 
Our third phase is to design our future governance models and then our last phase is to identify the transitional pathways to the new models. Um, our first phase, setting tikanga driven guardrails. Uh, this process encompasses the thorough literature review, as you do. Um, and I think one of the things to mention to um, the team that has been involved with the research um, have no academic, <laughs> like, sort of research background. Um, this, we're all pregnant practitioners ultimately so I must say the literature review is one of those things that you've got to do from what I understand so we did one of those um, the other thing too that we did was interview tikanga experts from around the motu so with uh, mātauranga uh, Māori background waka haurua traditional whale harvest te reo rangatira mahinga kai te tariti and hapu rights um, and from the literature review and our discussions and the expertise that's set within our, our research team as well, we developed our um, Ngā Pai Moana or our design principles. Now, one of the things that was interesting is um, these are our six sort of Pai Moana that serve as the foundation for developing our marine governance options. Um, initially, this was designed to help lead our research team <laughs> um, and it was to ensure because we were all sort of spread out across the country um, that we were all sailing the waka in the same direction so as a research team this was to guide us when we put it out for review from some of the different experts from across the way they actually said to us you've got your governance framework it's already there so it was like oh cool well that's a quick tick off the output for our tangaroa flow for our research project but yeah it was interesting so just going through um our framework so as i said it serves as the foundation for developing our marine governance options um one of the things that have come through too is, it, is that it is imperative that all six principles are incorporated or that the policy mechanisms are devised to promote and foster these behaviours. And again, going back to what Pierre was saying around our concepts. Our concepts are, are ways in which we will approach something. It's not the, the destination as such. As, as, as such. So, um, tātai hono, recognising the profound interconnectedness between humanity, the marine environment and the spiritual realm and actively honouring this relationship. Tō ututu, embracing the duty of care and reciprocity, acknowledging the inherent sense of obligation in any position of authority or decision making. Ngāhui, acknowledging the ocean's central role in driving our collective well-being and economic prosperity, encompassing community, welfare, economic success and environmental equilibrium. Mana, facilitating self-determination and authority by decentralising decision-making power, particularly emphasising the rangatiratanga of iwi and hapu as enshrined in te tariti o waitangi. Taurite, uh, value and respecting traditional knowledge systems, uh, cultural practices and protocols, and ensuring equity in decision-making processes. And finally, Tuipoto, which was which is around recognising and empowering local communities and their intimate place-based knowledge to inform governance systems that foster localised solutions and community-driven initiatives. Um, Our second um, research aim was to look at, is to dive deep. So, te ro muri hei anga whakamua. It is often said that Māori are people who with their eyes... I think that's my phone. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Saving me. <laughs> that's to pick up my baby from oh, school. <laughs> <laughs> Aroha mai, sorry. Um, it is often said that Māori are people who, with their eyes firmly focused on the past, walk assuredly towards the future. Um, as a research team, we acknowledge the needs for proactive and forward-looking approaches to address the multi-faceted issues surrounding the purpose of this research. Um, considering this, we adopted a futures thinking uh, perspective to guide our investigations with the aim of anticipating future trends, 
identifying emerging opportunities and effectively responding to potential disruptions. Um, there are numerous ways in which a futures thinking approach can be incorporated into research. For this part of our research, we employ two techniques, the futures, um, futures triangle and the causal layered analysis. Um, the futures triangle helps discern the material drivers of change um, and how they interact. The anchors due to the past histories, uh, forces driving and manipulating the present, and currents carrying us forth to the future. The future triangle allows us to assign importance to drivers of change that may originally feel out of place or at a different level of specificity than others. Um, the other technique that we used uh, was the causal layered analysis. Um, this framework provides a structured approach to understand issues at multiple layers of depth from superficial manifestations to underlying cultural and structural causes. This method consists of investigating the issue at four levels. Um, the more tangible and perceivable litany of events, um, the social systemic causes, the underlying embedded worldviews, and finally the entrenched myths, metaphors, and mental models that represent the root cause of the preceding layers. So for each of the um, deep dives that we did, so for customary fishing, commercial fishing and takutai, um, we used this to analyse those. So we um, ultimately what we did was to work with and talk to those uh, in these areas um, and then being able to look at these. So one of the things where you look at, I suppose more from a policy development process, one of the things that I've seen in DPMC, for example, is around this futures thinking and policy development and how do you look into the future to try to identify behaviours and incentives that need to be changed to create that future that you want. Um, so that's the approach that we've sort of taken here. The main area that you need to focus in on and better understand is, is I suppose, the myths, metaphors and values that are sort of ingrained or are, are unconscious. Um, and that in particular is for non-Māori as well in terms of the, the, their different drivers and stuff. Um, so some of the things like the litany of events are examples of sort of you hear things on the news about the oceans, about um, commercial fishes and, and what they're doing, etc. Or you hear from a customary fishing perspective, oh, it's not working for us, the system doesn't work for us, we don't have rangatiratanga. And so what you do through that analysis is you start to dive deep into, okay, he, we're hearing all these things that are happening with the social and systemic, oh, sorry, spelling mistake, social and systemic causes, um, why are they happening? What are the, what are the, what are the problems? Why are those, this noise up here happening all the time? And then coming down to what are those world views? Why do people hold the views that they do? Um, and then the last one here is around why is it ingrained? Like there's, there's a, an unconsciousness that you have where you sort of see something on the news and you already have a, a perception or a perspective before actually knowing the detail. So yeah, um, this was our approach when we investigated the, the, the three focus areas. What am I up to? Um, so there was a lot of um, analysis, I suppose, that we, we did. It seemed like overkill at the time, to tell you the truth, and that's probably why it's taken so long. Um, but um, this is but a snapshot, and there's only five points, but I can tell you now there are pages and pages of it um, in our report. <laughs> and so one of our things was around, um, we have developed a set of summary cards. We're at the moment making them look pretty, um, but they go into a little bit more detail around our, our report that we've just done. Um, so the snapshot of our findings is the journey of Māori fishing rights in New Zealand embodies a narrative of perseverance, resilience and adaptation. Now one of the things, sorry, I, I'll just jump back into is that, I don't know, how do I go backwards? Maybe I can't. That one? No, it's not going to let me. No, all right, leave it Beth. Um, one of the things that we, I talked about the futures triangle, so we talked about the weight of the past, the push of the present and the pull of the future. Uh, this particular 
research aim looked at the weight of the past. So we did explore sort of pre-colonial times, um, how, what was Māori's relationship with the oceans? How did we interact with it? What was our tikanga? One of the things that Joe Williams talks about was um, the first law of Aotearoa, which is our tikanga. Um, and then the second um, law that came in was when the two cultures came together. And so it is from that point where you see an evolution of us losing ultimately the way that we would have traditionally or um, have governed our, um, our oceans, which is very much tikanga based. So using concepts. The other thing we talk about in our report is around how Western or the Westminster system has strict rules, whereas tikanga Māori has more of a, um, yeah, our, our concepts. And again, Pia picked up on it where we put, it, it's more about the destination and the way that we approach things rather than the, um, it needing to sit in a particular box and have certainty. So I think that's the uncomfortable space that we see in policy now is that often a te ao Māori view on things, we can sort of work in more ambiguity, um, whereas the laws that we have to operate under have strict sort of rules and systems and how we need to do things. Um, so sorry, jumping back into it. So that's why this, this first one here in terms of the journey of Māori fishing rights in New Zealand embodies a narrative of perseverance, resilience and adaptation. Um, we acknowledge that while significant strides have been made in securing recognition and protection for these rights, the ongoing battles underscore the importance of sustained advocacy and collective action to ensure that Māori fishing rights are not only upheld, but also respected and celebrated as an integral part of New Zealand's cultural heritage and identity. And um, we have some people in here that work in Te Hukaimwana that I know every day sort of are battling these types of things in terms of that ongoing battle to protect those rights that have been secured. Um, tikanga represents a unique approach to governance and societal um, organisation rooted in core values and principles that prioritise relationships, responsibility and sustainability. Its adaptability and flexibility make it well suited to address the diverse needs and challenges faced by Māori communities, while its emphasis on relational dy dynamics foster a sense of kinship and interconnectedness. Understanding tikanga requires a deeper appreciation for its philosophical underpinnings and holistic governance approach, highlighting the significance of values-driven systems of control and shaping cultural identity and societal well-being. Um, the issue of customary fishing rights in Aotearoa is multifaceted, involving historical injustices, legal frameworks, cultural values and contemporary politics. Despite the efforts such as the Treaty of Waitangi Fisheries Claims Settlement Act 1992, settler colonial policies still limit Māori customary rights. Challenges include the dilution of key principles like te noranga tiratanga and kaitiakitanga and the Crown's reluctance to devolve power in decision making, particularly evident in the Kaimuana regulations. Um, recent developments though in the South Island show some progress with power devolution. Um, however, Indigenous knowledge continues to be marginalised, hindering holistic management approaches. Um, over the last 30 years, significant changes have occurred in Māori commercial fishing. Uh, since the Māori fishery settlement, iwi have gained influence in various sectors, including fishing, but the authority remains limited, with ongoing challenges from governmental actions. Tensions persist between commercial, recreational and customary fishing in interests, necessitating cooperation to manage conflicts. Protecting commercial rights, ensuring sustainability, addressing climate change impacts and fostering cooperation between commercial and non-commercial fishing are essential. Collaboration and alignment among Māori fisheries entities are crucial for addressing industry challenges. The Marine and Coastal Act is a political compromise. Neither this Act nor the one preceding it, which was the Foreshore and Seabed Act, were about giving our rights back to Māori. These acts have been about extinguishing our rights. As we work through the implementation of this legislation, the Crown continues to dilute our rights, reducing them to a lesser extent 
than they were prior to the Forshaw and Seabed um, Act. Literature largely criticises the MECA Act procedurally and substantially. Substantively. Procedurally, it's criticised for, um, for the recognition of customary marine title and protected customary rights as are seen as less favourable than the common law rights. I'll be interested to hear people's feedback on that. <laughs> um, I'll oh, see, I knew I was going to bugger that up. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, come on, thank you. Yes, nice. All right, so designing future governance models. Now, I'm one of those ones that are still getting to this bit. Um, so they are there. We just haven't written them up yet. So the upcoming phase of our project focuses on synthesising all of our pre previous work. So this involves consolidating the Ngāpāi Moana framework, exploring change scenarios, which we did ages ago. I just still haven't written it up. And utilising tools such as the Futures Triangle and Causal Layered Analysis. So within the governance model options, it will consider the systems, the processes and the structures required. The objective of this phase is to develop um, marine governance model options firmly rooted in tikanga and, um, and te tiriti and using that, um, our guiding framework as the foundation for that. Um, and then in parallel to, because we're coming to the end of the challenge and I need to hurry up, in parallel to that we'll be doing our transitional pathways um, to new models and um, Fire Legal are leading that piece. Um, and so the purpose of this will be to identify the measures to move from the status quo to the proposed governance models, identify the legislative and policy changes required to make the, necess the necessary shifts, and identify implementation pathways and require support resources to achieve those. Um, yeah. Now this is going to be my last slide. So um, our, our project has always um, aimed for widespread recognition of, oh, oh yeah, car plate. Yeah, that's awesome. This is my last slide, I think, yeah. Um, so our project has also aimed for widespread recognition of the benefits of tikanga Māori and te tiriti governance models among all New Zealanders. Achieving this goal requires ensuring that all individuals with connections to the marine environment feel included in the model options identified through our research. Um, traditionally and still today, knowledge transmission occurs through various cultural mediums such as pūrāko, whakapapa, whakatauki, waiata, haka and toi Māori. Um, to honour this kaupapa of our project, it's essential that in addition to the written reports, which we know everyone doesn't read, um, our findings are going to be shared in a manner that aligns with <coughs> the Te Ao Māori worldview. Um, and so at the end... We're looking at holding an upcoming art exhibition at the end of June <coughs> where we will transfer and disseminate knowledge generated from the project. Um, we've collaborated with a group of artists who are currently creating pieces inspired by our research. Additionally, we're exploring opportunities to incorporate waiata and taonga puoro. Um, during the, ex the exhibition, we plan to host workshops in Wānanga to share our findings and foster discussions from both legal policy and creative perspectives. Um, and yeah, we hope that people might be able to join us and I'll be able to give you a full, <laughs> um, uh, I suppose, in terms of our outputs um, in Wellington on during the 19th to the 21st of June. Um, but yeah, one of the things, the reason why this, this in particular was, is quite a key part of our research project um, and one of those things was around, well, how do you make impact? And having worked in government policy, and as Pierre again mentioned, policy can take a very long time before you actually see any real results. Um, and so one of the things was around, and, and having worked both with government and with Māori, um, the challenges that we always see is that um, lack of understanding of how to incorporate Mā Tauranga Māori or an unwillingness sometimes as well. So one of the things on this project is how do you create a um, policy framework that can enable communities ultimately to, um, 
develop their own way of doing things. So some of the challenges I've seen, and I'm sort of just cut me off because I'm just going to ramble now, um, is around having worked at a national policy level, whether it was with water or uh, the oceans, the fisheries, etc., that ability to embed a te ao Māori world view at an operational level is quite challenging. Um, some of the things that I see have been working or have been sort of moving across there but might change with this new government is, ha is actually being te mano te wai. Um, and it's one of those things where you can embed a concept into there but enable communities to define what that means for them. Um, so that's, that's just an example, but how do we create systems, especially when we look at the legislative regime for oceans is so vast. Um, and so there are some real big challenges there. But again, coming back to the point, how do we put Tangaroa and Hinamoana at the centre of decision making? And I think if you have that in mind, um, and I saw this in a corridor that I had um, around the Hauraki Gulf and it was part of Sustainable Seas um, Mahi at the time, where people were trying to be protective of their rights. But when you change the discussion around, um, well, not so much I'm going to give up my rights so that person over there benefits. It's more, well, what do we give back to the ocean, to the sea before? So putting that first as a decision-making tool. And there's all different ways that you can start to do that, but ultimately it's a willingness of the people. Um, because, again, the system that we currently have is about resource extraction. Um, and that's just how it is. But if we're wanting to evolve and make changes to be able to have a long, enduring relationship with the moana, then these are the types of shifts that need to be made. And so when I think about around, well, how do you move the hearts and minds of all New Zealanders um, to, to, to move a little bit closer towards this other regime that, like I say, was our sort of first law in doing things. It's not saying that that's the golden... Uh, or that's the silver bullet that's going to solve everyone's problems. But I think just changing that mind shift on how we look at the oceans. And I'm probably preaching to people that are here already on board on that waka. So um, it's not so much that. But yeah, I think when you look at currently the new government of the day, you can see how easily those things can sway. And this stuff, national policy, well, policy development and legislation is very much impacted on by the politics of the day. And so you have to play that game. So yeah, that is me. Kapoi. Kim.